Welcome to the All Things Real Estate Podcast with our very own Josh Barker. With more than 20 years of experience and over 5,000 properties sold, Josh brings a unique perspective to the real estate market. Let's get started. Okay. Okay. So now it feels, now if I talk about the Ides of March, it feels disgenuine. You know what I mean? Now if I repeat everything I said before. But well, what is it about the Ides of March for you? Uh, just, uh, I don't know. I really, uh, Augustus Caesar is one of my all time yeah. I don't know, historical heroes, sure. just the story, his, his life and his death. I don't know if a lot of people know about his death, but it's, to me, it's an incredible story. Yeah. I mean, he, he found Rome in clay and he left it in marble and he started Pax Romana, which is over 200 years of peace. So anyway, and his uncle Julius Caesar, I think set the stage for, uh, Augustus. So I don't know why yeah. that this, all this sticks got in deep. my head. This got yeah. real this morning. Eh. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So, so it's, uh, it's the middle of March. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's the middle of March. <laughs> We, interest rates just went up. Yep. It's, that was not a shock. I mean, they've been telling us for months and months. Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff going on, and interest rates are – it's not just the quarter percent that the Fed's raised. There are a lot of mechanics in play that mm-hmm. interest rates are – I mean, what are they this morning if I was going to get a home Just loan, under 5%. Which, I mean, not long ago they were in the twos. Oh, yeah. They were threes. like 2.8, 2.9 in November. And you've been telling us how much even a half a point – increase in interest rate how much that impacts your buying power yeah so for every one percent that the interest rate goes up it has an impact on purchasing power by up to ten percent so it's huge it's huge well yeah i mean over the last six months we've seen basically a 20 percent hit in purchasing power for the average buyer which is a major headwind major headwind uh, it should yeah. slow things down a bit now we've got a major tailwind but even that's starting to creep up a little bit with inventory. Yeah, inventory. Yeah. So uh, inventory, home inventory on average in the city of Reading or in the multiple listing service for active residential homes was like 372 weeks ago. It's averaging about 415, 420 today. So it's slowly, it's still stubborn though, but it's slowly creeping up. But that's, that's why the prices haven't changed because the inventory is still so darn low that we're definitely still in a seller's market. But that purchasing power piece that the buyers are running up against, you know, the affordability index, they're running right into that wall right now. And uh, so the next month or two is going to be pretty telling on what impact that has on the market. Especially because these are the the big selling months. This is when a lot of the people from out of the area come and check out Reading. Yep. And I mean, these are big sales months for Reading. So we're, there's a lot of uh, the crystal ball is very cloudy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're kind of in that chamber of commerce weather right now, right? Between March, April, May, and June until it starts to get really hot. And, um, you know, we see a lot of inventory come to market over the next three to four months from now. Um, the question will be is that as they come to market, will the buyers come to market with them with the impact of interest rates? And there's no, there's no like a, a report that you can get to go, oh, yeah, this is how many buyers. I mean, this is just flat out a blank space of you don't know. <clears throat> well, yeah, yes and no. I, I, I think because not all price ranges are the same, right? So mm-hmm. I think that what the interest rates did yesterday, moving up a quarter basis point, which was fully projected and expected, um, you know, and the corresponding effect being the rates on the mortgage rates are going up. Um, but remember, we also had tapering happening. So the Federal Reserve right now is reducing the amount of mortgage-backed securities that they're purchasing while they're raising interest rates. And so you have the shrinking up of, of availability of credit. And you also have rates going up. And so we're waiting to see that private market step in and start buying these mortgages. Okay. If they don't, then you're going to start to see even more impacts on that. But um, but not all prices ranges ranges are the same. So like our upper end, that's a more discretionary purchase for a buyer, meaning that, you know, I might buy home at 700 or I might buy home at 800. It really depends on what the home has to offer. But a buyer at 300, normally they're, they're buying up to every penny that they qualify for because it has a significant impact on the type of home they might buy. You know what I mean? Yes. So when the rates go up and let's say you were qualified at 400,000 yesterday or six months ago at 400,000 today, that same buyer now is qualified at approximately 320,000 today. That's a huge impact on purchasing power. And other factors that are involved are things like we've talked before, (laughs) the supply chain, just the ability to build a home, being able to replace inventory below 320,000 is very, very difficult around here. Uh, almost yeah. impossible. Yeah, I had a lunch a, about three weeks ago with a builder here in town that does quite a few homes. And we were talking about the, you know, resupplying the lower end part of the market. And it's extremely cost prohibitive for these builders because the lot cost of land acquisition, uh, the development costs, they call it the front foot, right? So like curb gutter, sidewalk, sewer, electrical, you know, all the stuff they have to do just to get a lot ready to be built on. 
that, that cost is pretty much fixed, whether you build a home that's, you know, 3000 square feet or 1400 square feet, that portion of it still costs the same. You know, those roads costed the same, the lights costed the same, the hydrants costed the same, um, you know, the water lines, the sewer lines, all that stuff. So they're, they're looking at it going, the larger the home we can build and still sell. Try to get profit, try right. to make some profit. The more profitable it's going to be. And so this is where we're running into this issue that, you know, the lower end of the market is just not being able to be resupplied properly. And that's where most people can afford. Um, and you and I have talked about this before. I'm pretty sure maybe on maybe one of the podcasts, I don't know. But if we went back to the building standards of the early 1990s for homes up to, you know, 15, 1600 square feet, and we just did that for three years, you would naturally move all of the, not all of it, but a significant amount of, of construction would be moved to um, those smaller homes because, you know, the solar wouldn't be required anymore. Some of the insulation requirements wouldn't be there. Some of the building methods and standards wouldn't necessarily be there. Not that the houses would fall down. None of the other houses in the 1990s are falling down today. They're still good homes. Absolutely. So if we went back to those standards for a period of time, and only up for homes up to 1,600 square feet, well, now you, you're kind of, you know, pushing the market in that direction. So, you know, <clears throat> when they talk about, you know, they, we have to solve the housing issue, it's like, yeah, but you, you have to be willing to give something up to do that. You, you, you know what I mean? Exactly. You have to be willing to give up some of the, you know, the perfect world scenarios that everybody wants to create um, to allow for some development that way. But these builders right now, they, can, they just can't do it. Is that, are those state, county, or city requirements? Or state, really. State I mean, so it kind of trickles so, yeah. down from the state. Yeah. And they tell the, you know, they tell the counties, this is what you have to do, you know, and the cities have to, you know, comply with this or they lose, you know, certain sorts of funding and things like that. It's all about, you know, the, the state has leverage over, the, uh, over local communities when it comes to funding. You know what I mean? So if you don't do what we want, we won't give you the money. And, and that's the big challenge that, you know, cities and, and counties have. And when you get outside of Redding, when you get outside of Shasta County and you think about the state, you think about like Los Angeles and yeah. San Diego and San Francisco, th those those costs almost are negligible because real estate is so insanely expensive. It's so expensive. So they don't see like to them. They're like, why would we take out, you know, the need for solar and stuff like yeah. that? That doesn't that doesn't really impact a brand new home in Los Angeles County. No. And so they don't get it. So, no. it yeah. But these people are moving out of, out of L.A. might want to move to another, you know, secondary market. Reading certainly one of those. Um, there's a lot of cities like Reading up and down the state, though, that they, they instead of leaving the state, they'd stay in the state if they could find affordable housing, you know, that meets their needs. Right. So um, they haven't gotten serious about it, in my opinion. Um, if they did, they would have already changed some of that stuff. And I wonder, because at the same time, you see things like, you know, I think the city of Reading has a, a big program around these ADUs. Yeah. They've approved these plans and they've said, hey, if you'll build these, they're going to, I don't know the exact, but they're going to waive certain fees. Mm -hmm. There's certain costs they're going to minimize. Now, I looked at these ADUs and the designs were pretty intricate. I was like, almost anything you the city gave up in fees, it's like you're going to spend on... Um, materials yeah so, so like, ADUs are like washed. small little houses that you're that you put on your existing property mm -hmm. um, but that's that that might solve uh, some of the housing but think about what that means that means it has to go on a lot that has the room number one mm -hmm. to put an ADU mm -hmm. on it mm -hmm. number two you have to have the financial cap uh, capacity to actually write a check to do that to, to have that second or refinance your home or whatever so that narrows the market a little bit and then you have what you just said, which was the cost benefit of actually building something like that right now, because it's still pretty darn expensive. I'm not, I, I think it's still a great solution, especially like if you have parents or anything else that you want to have move on to your property. And now the, now the county code and the city code is going to provide you for you to do that. I think that's great. Um, but is it going to solve the problem? You know, not, no, but it's, it's, it's going to probably contribute a little bit uh, to some of a solution. I think if you want to solve it, though, it goes back to what I'm saying a few minutes ago, change the code for homes up to a certain square footage for the next three years and f have builders have an, a financial incentive to go that direction with their construction method. Because the state talks like they build homes. The last time I checked, the state doesn't build homes, no. okay? Um, and so what you're asking is the private sector to build homes. And in order to do that, there has to be a cost benefit because they're not nonprofits they're for profit. They have to actually have a reasonable profit for the work they do, or they can't do it. Doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to do it. Um, so we'll see. You know, I think about, uh, so when you were talking about the segments, different segments are going to be affected by interest rates, right? Yeah. You basically said the lower <laughs> segment where people are, uh, 
uh, financing to the very the most that they can. Yep. Versus somebody buying eight hundred thousand dollar house, it's it's so now they can only buy a seven hundred sixty thousand dollar house, something like that. It's just not quite. It doesn't impact the same. So if you start, you're basically going to pull first time buyers. Um, I mean, you think about people that buy at that lower yeah. end, you're pulling them out and what you're going to do is you're going to make sure they're renters because what's going to happen is the investors, the people with money are going to go, oh, okay, well, I can put in a cash offer. I really didn't, yeah. I didn't really care about interest yeah. rates. And so they're going to, you wonder how much they'll backfill in that purchase because that'll have an effect on the market as well. It, it will. It's, um, well, right now what you were looking at is that, um, and affordability, you know, and that affordability index, right? So mm -hmm. as rates move up, there's a percentage of the buying market that falls off altogether. They yeah. can no longer participate because what they do qualify for with rates going up, there's no product available on the market for them to purchase as a result. So as rates go up, we're automatically losing these people. They're automatically falling off the purchasing side of this whole equation, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, then you have people that are still in the market, but the type of home that they're purchasing starts to change. So you know, in Redding, California, and a lot of people won't, won't know our market directly, but um, if you take a neighborhood, let's say it's a $600,000 neighborhood, and it's a popular neighborhood, a lot of people want to be in it. Let's say you were qualified there six months ago. Well, now, because the rates went up, you can't buy in that neighborhood anymore. Now you're going to be purchasing in a neighborhood that's a little bit less, maybe a $500,000 neighborhood now. And so now you literally have to move to a different neighborhood because you can't afford the one that you were qualified in before. And so that's what's going to happen in the middle market. That upper end, again, the discretionary piece there is that a lot of people that buy homes at 800 to a million dollars, they could buy it for a million or they could buy it for 800. That, that, it doesn't, that, that part of it doesn't affect them as much. It's just which home meets their needs the most. And so with rates moving up, it doesn't have as much of an impact as it does in the other two examples I just gave you. you know, and that's, that's the challenge, right? And so if these folks move into the rental situation, and now we have more and more people have to move into rental properties um, as a result because they can't buy if you have few, not a lot of rental properties available and you have a higher demand for rental property, what happens to the rents? Yeah, the rents go up. They go up. Yeah. All right. And so I was talking to an investor out of LA uh, about this just the other day. Um, they represent a large fund um, with a lot of investments in it. And they say what they're dealing with is what they call cap, uh, cap compression, meaning that their cap rates are really low. And they can't get the values out of these properties that they want for selling them. And they have some investors in those pools that they need to, at some point, they need to sell these properties. The only way to get out of that is they're going to have to raise rate, uh, raise rents. And so I think you're going to probably see the next year to two years, you're going to see rents actually going up um, from some of these things that are going on. We have to solve the inventory issue. Um, I mean, bottom line, we have to get more homes out there on the market. We have to stabilize pricing. We have to get it to where people can actually get into homes. We're going to have a serious problem. So besides lowering the um, requirements to build a home, what yeah. are some other things that can be done, you know, to, to help replace that inventory? Yeah. Conversations. You know, I told our sales team about this um, probably at the beginning of the month. I just said, you know, the number one issue, I think, or the number one thing that agent real estate companies can do to get involved in this problem is to have conversations with consumers. If we start talking with buyers and sellers about the benefits of owning a home or selling a home and moving on with your life to the next home, we could start to free up some of this inventory because if more property owners decided to bring their homes to the market, you'd have more buyers then have the result, have the benefit of choosing to, you know, choosing different homes. And now you can start to create additional transactions, which otherwise wouldn't exist. And we have to get this whole train moving again is really what we're talking about. Um, and it starts with conversations. You know, we have to get out there in the community, talk to people, talk about the benefits. Say, hey, you're thinking about moving into a larger home. Why wait? You know, what's what's the point of waiting? If, if you know, life is short, life is precious. You know, do you want to spend your time in this home or would you rather spend your time in the ideal home? You know, either way, you know, you, you're going to spend time somewhere. And so, so having conversations like that. It's like trying to time, you know, people that try to time the stock market or something like that. It's, it's when I hear these conversations, everyone's like, well, the interest rates are going to do this and then inventory is going to do that. And it's like, you can't time that. You don't, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we can see in the short term, the yeah. feds have said, we're going to raise interest rates. We're slowing down the buying the market, but how far would that go and how long will affect that have? So I, what I heard was if you want to do something, then do it now versus trying to time the market and say, oh, well, I, I know next spring this is going to happen or next summer that's going to happen. It's like, you have no idea what's going to happen. No. And, and, you know, this, when we do this podcast, we're kind of jumping onto a lot of different topics. 
I mean, for an investor, timing is pretty important. You know what I mean? You got to know when, when to, what, when to buy and what to buy and how to buy and all those things. But for regular mom and pop homeowners, you know, there, there's a, you know, it's kind of like a scale, right? So you've got on one side of it, you have the dollars and cents, you know, making a good financial investment, right? That's one side of the scale. But the other one is, this is my life. What, what's going to make our family enjoy this the most, right? Bedrooms and baths and square footage and location and, you know, having a home versus not having a home. And so this is the kind of the emotional component. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you're looking at a homeowner buying something, it's the scale that kind of has an impact on which way you go and what decisions you make. So it's not always about money when, it, when it's your home. You know what I mean? It has this emotional component. I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, my wife and I in 2005, 2006, we felt the market was about to change. Right. So we sold our primary residence. Right. And we actually sold off a lot of our investments and um, we moved into a friend of mine's uh, rental uh, that was on the river. And our thought was, hey, honey, let's just sit here. We'll let the market make some adjustments. And then once it's done doing that, we'll go back in and, and either build a home or buy a home. And so we did that. We moved into uh, we moved into a friend's rental and uh, the market did what it did. We, we all know it started to go down. And I mean, we could have been wrong in that, but we just thought we were probably right. Um, and then what happened was, is that I was in there for like a year, love and life, watching the market going down. I'm not, I'm not participating in the market at this moment. So I'm realizing, hey, I'm going to be able to go back in and buy all this stuff, your pennies on the dollar, right? And my wife comes to me and she says, hey, Josh, I got a question for you. Yeah, when do we get to get our new house? I'm like, what are you talking about? The market's still going down. There's no reason to go. This is crazy. We're saving money right now by not doing anything at all. And my wife looks at me and she says, well, let me ask you a question. What is the happiness of your family worth to you? I was like, uh, guess we're going to go get a house. And so I decided to go build a house because I figured that was where the best value was at that moment. Um, and we're still actually in that house. But that was, you know, that was me looking at the scale and going, yeah, the numbers make sense to not do this. But my wife's got a good point. Happiness in the family is more important. So we're pulling the trigger. I think we're talking about when I heard you talk was the difference between someone talking about their primary residence and somebody talking about using real estate as an investment vehicle. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? This is this is numbers and this is uh, don't try to time if you want a bigger home. Yeah. It's if you look at you know, the, the real estate markets like the stock market where it has these dips, but it's always climbing. It's climbing. You know yeah. I mean? So it's trying to time those dips. And if you're in a home and it goes down in value or you're in a home and it goes up in value, if you're in a home, you're going to receive it either way. So you know, if you're in this house and it's going to go up in value over time and the house you buy is going to go in over time, where do you want to spend your time? The ideal home while it's going up in value or this home? And the same thing is true, unfortunately, when it goes down. The only way out of that is if you remove yourself from the market altogether and move into that rental situation that I just gave you. But I use a car uh, sales term. I want to sell for retail and buy for wholesale. Everybody Josh. does. I mean, come on. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. I, you give me retail for mine, I'll, I'll give you wholesale for yours, right? And you can do that, but you have to be a pretty savvy investor because there's one thing that you can't be tied to, the outcome. Okay, meaning that you can't fall in love with something if you're an investor. It has to stay on the black and white side of the equation because as soon as you bring the emotional component in, you stop making the right decisions on this, right? So, Good call. Um, so if you're going to move into a home, it's really hard to just see that as a black and white thing. Not that you can't do it. We've done it a few times early in our, you know, in our life uh, where we bought a house fully intentionally, didn't like it, but knew that we were just going to fix it up and eventually sell it, move into the bigger home. Right. So, you know, we can do that, but, but not everybody's doing that. No, you know, so you got to make a decision and, and really got to look at that scale. What's more important. And so it, to shift to investors. So people that are thinking about, you know, should I release inventory? I have. What are some options for them? I mean, because if you sell right now, what do you put it into? Where are you going to put that money? Mm, that's you know hard, I mean? man. Yeah. So <clears throat> what you can do is you can sell your property and you don't want to pay the taxes. That's usually the biggest issue. Like yeah. if you, you know, if you've owned a rental for a while, um, you have the depreciation that you've probably taken off that property during that time that you have to recapture. Um, and then you have either short term, if you had it less than a year or long term, if you've had it more than a year of capital gains. Mm -hmm. And capital gains is both at the federal level and at the state level. So, um, you know, so po folks, when they go to sell a rental property, if they don't exchange, there's probably going to be a significant taxable event that's going to take place. Right. And so um, I'll give you an example. Um, if you had a property and let's just use round numbers, the property that's worth two hundred thousand dollars. And let's say I've owned it for 10 years. So I've depreciated it for 10 years. Um, and let's say that I own it, you know, I bought it for a hundred thousand. Now it's worth 200,000. Okay. Okay. So I've got about a hundred thousand of actual profit there too. When I go to sell that property, I get to deduct the fees for selling it. 
And then I get to, you know, take the acquisition cost and then you add in depreciation that you've already taken. So I don't want to complicate this conversation, but let's just say that you have a profit when that's all sudden down to 75,000 a profit that now is taxable. Now I have my long-term capital gain, depending on your tax brackets, that'll impact this a little bit, but let's just say for a round number, it's 35% on 75 grand, right? I don't know what the exact number is on that, but about 23,000. Okay. Somewhere in there. Right. right so now. let's just say you have maybe 50 grand left over now that I get to go invest when I go sell this property. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, which, okay. It's something. And let's go, you put it in the market at three or 4% somewhere. I don't know, somewhere. Um, so that's kind of what people could look at as an option. There's other options that are out there too, though, where like you can go into what's called like a DST. Uh, it's like a Delaware statutory trust. It's, um, um, a situation where you, you, you take your, your, your sale and you exchange into this company. Um, and then, you know, you avoid, um, having to pay any capital gains at that time. And so now you have that full profit of a hundred thousand that's still getting you maybe three to 4% return. Does that make sense? So what is, is the DST, does it hold other real estate? Is it real estate to real estate? Yeah, they're, they're like, like a fund, a big one. And you have to be a qualified investor for that, meaning that you have to have a net worth of a million dollars uh, or more. And then also, or, or at least an income of 200,000 for an individual. And I think it's like 300,000 if you're married or something. So it's something, you know, anybody on this would have to just check it out. But, uh, but these new, these are new things that are becoming available. These are instruments that are becoming available where you can actually sell a rental property and now you can take the, the, the exchange it then into a DST. And these are companies that own large, large com that own large amounts of real estate. Um, and then they, you know, they run the performance. It's publicly traded stuff. So it's not like, you know, you're not, you're not selling it to your cousin Vinny or anything like that. These are legitimate companies and they have to show you performance and everything else. Um, and then, you know, their returns are, you know, three to 4%. You get the appreciation side of it over time. And normally your exits anywhere from, you know, five years on the short end to maybe 10 years on the long end, depending on what you're doing. But the, the point in this conversation is, is that if, if I did that, if I exchanged, I get to keep that full hundred thousand of profit working for me. If I were to not exchange, well, then I might only have about 50,000, right. To go and invest, to have working for me. Exactly. Um, and that's the difference between those two. And then, you know, then there's the normal exchange, which is, you know, you got to find another property and exchange into it. Now, both of those are probably like just tax deferred, right? Meaning you don't, you don't have to pay taxes now. So you're effectively getting a 0% interest loan from the government because they're like, okay, you owe us, 25,000 taxes, but we're going to wait, you know, wait. And so you just keep going with it. Like you said, 10 years. Yeah. So they, and you're earning three to 4% on the money that you would have had to have given the government. Right. So it's kind of like, the, it's, it's kind of like a zero interest loan. I mean, when you, it's, you know, yeah, but there is one caveat to it. Okay. Though, is that there's if, always a caveat, Josh, <laughs> if you, it's true. Um, let's say you're a married couple and we have that investment and I pass away. Now uh, I get to, now that cost basis gets reset. And so it creates this kind of interesting situation where you get to avoid some of the, the taxes because now that depreciation that you already took, when it gets reset, the cost basis gets reset, you almost get to start the depreciation piece over again. So, um, I mean, I'm not the expert on this stuff. I don't want to claim to be. So anybody listen to this, go talk to a CPA about what I'm just, what I'm saying right now, um, because they'll, they'll take you in the weeds much deeper than I want to. Um, but it's, but yeah, there's some, there's some reasons why people continue to exchange up into bigger and bigger properties, because what they're doing essentially is they're moving out that depreciation. They're, they're, they're moving, they're increasing the amount of write-offs they get, um, as a result of doing that. So there's a strategy behind it. There was a couple of builders, um, uh, years ago, I remember when I first got into real estate and they were, um, they were building homes and then they, they kept 1030 wanting them up and both of them independent of each other. 1031 into they built apartment complexes mm -hmm. and it, there's a lot of rules and intricacies here. But uh, the idea was that they just kept deferring the taxes. You know, this is all legal where they just kept rolling the money over and over yeah. and over until finally they rolled it into an entity that they said, well, I'll never, I'll never sell that. Right. And the effectively what had happened was instead of all those times paying, paying taxes, taxes yeah. they, they got a 0% effective yeah. interest loan yeah. from the government yeah. to build really large units. Yeah. I think one of them did, they did like five, four plexes. Cause there's a, cause what we're talking about is 1031 exchanges yeah. and then the DST is another option. And there's, I think there are some more options. You and I were talking about some, 
There's like tenants in common and stuff like that, yeah, which I'm not a huge fan of because of the cash, you know, the capital call that you might have on it. And remember, like tenants in common is another option. And those were very popular over the last 10, 15 years. But the problem with them is, is that let's say you have a group of like five to seven people that are in this tenant in common, right? Mm-hmm. You pretty much all have to agree on whatever needs to be done. So let's say that the roof is failing and the choice is patch it or replace it. Right. Well, you got to get on the same page on that. And so a lot of times tenant commons turn into these deferred maintenance nightmares Yeah. because you can't get anybody to agree to take care of the property the way it needs to be taken care of. And so it starts to go down in condition, therefore in value. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's tough. You know, that's a big reason why my wife and I, we've never had a tenants in common with anybody because we don't like to have somebody else dictating what we can and can't do with our property. Um, but like those DSTs, you're, you're signing off. I mean, you might as well kind of have the idea that you're giving it away to a mutual fund, so to speak, because you're not, you don't have any management over it. You have no decision-making over it. Um, you know, they give you a performa based on what they think the returns will be on your investment and then what the potential for appreciation is over time and you're done. That's it. So that's not for everybody either, you know? So, um, and in exchanging, you've got a, you know, you're under, you're under a time clock, right? So you exchange, it's going to go fast. You're going to have to sell your property. You got 45 days to identify and you have a total of 180 days to close. Um, so you got, you got to move forward with it. So I think one of the big, uh, X factors in all of this right now, um, because I was just talking to a buddy of mine who has a, uh, he, he was, there is a project in town that is, um, a, an approved, I think apartment complex mm-hmm. and the land. And he was talking about, wanting to sell what he had and move into that project. But the problem was the ability to finish that project in a time that would meet those yeah. 1031. So you know, normally he might've been able to pull that off, but with supply chains, the way things yep. are, it's so, it, you know, it, I'm, we're sitting here, there's a lot of options, oh, man. And a, a lot of cloudiness. Oh yeah. Up. It's brutal, man. I, uh, <laughs> I, I would never recommend um, trying to do a, a construction and an exchange again. I've done it before. But we didn't, you know, it was in 2007 on Hempstead. My wife and I did a reverse exchange where we sold some buildings. We bought a, a raw piece of property and built two buildings on it in six months. Um, Impressive. On a reverse exchange. Impressive. <laughs> well, I feel bad for the exchange company because he was the one that had to write the checks on all the draws. I mean, it turned into this logistical nightmare for the exchange company. I, I mean, I can't believe the work they did for us. It was incredible. Uh, we still refer to them to this day because I feel like I still owe them, you know, for all that work they did. Um, they were they were just incredible. But um, but that's the, the time constraints that are involved in construction on exchanges is just it's so many elements now that are out of your control. I would I would never have done what I did actually if I would have known what I was going to have to go through to do it. I would never have done it again. It's it's scary. And certainly not in today's market where supply chains are still mm-hmm. fluctuating. Things are still a little bit. Uh, yeah. So, but the bottom line is uh, you have options. You do. There are plenty of options out there. Yep, absolutely. So to sum it up, I mean, mm-hmm. essentially, um, you know, the Federal Reserve, you know, they did raise the interest rate um, by a quarter percent yesterday. Um, corresponding effect was rates went up and we're probably looking at rates right around below 5% now and it might go up higher than that. The Fed also, though, did say that they expected to maybe raise rates again multiple times this year. So um, we're looking at a higher rate environment. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the buyers that are affected that like we talked about, you know, as rates go up, it purchasing power is affected. So we're going to be seeing some of that play out. But um, in any case, for our listeners today, we're just trying to be consistent with giving you guys some good content and. Any other thoughts on that, Joy? No. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, you know, there's a lot going on and people have questions and hopefully, uh, you know, we were able to answer some of those questions. You were able to answer some of those questions uh, for them. And uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.